Like Valentine's Day, see what the mission cost with the finish. Yeah. Don't try to slide in my DM. OJ Simpson with the defense. Leg of fire saying the end last weekend, but not today, say. Come on, put your hands together. At the count of three, I want you to shout it out. One, two, three. Not today, Satan. Come on. We want to thank Aaron Medio from Hip Hop. Chris, that's Christian Hip Hop right there, buddy. And we need to have some people that are taking Jesus to the streets. Amen. There's plenty of people taking Jesus in the seats, but we got to take Jesus to the streets. And today, we need to have a message about not today, Satan. Let's not let Satan keep bullying us, beating us up, taking advantage of us. You know, let's just admit it, a lot of Christians look like they're ready for a spiritual ICU unit. You know, they've been, they've been beat up and run over and looks like a steamroller ran them over. And God doesn't want us to live like that. God wants us to be overcomers. He wants us to be a people of victory. Amen? The Bible says he always causes us to triumph. Now, here's what I want to do. I want you to grab your Bibles and stand to your feet, okay? Let's give reverence to the Word of God. Hold up your Bible, or if it's your cell phone that you read your Bible from, hold it up and confess together with me. This is my Bible. I am what it says that I am. I have what it says that I have, and I can do what it says that I can do. And I know. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You are so good at that. Give somebody a high five and you may be seated. Today we're going to start off in the book of Ephesians. We got a bunch of scriptures. Get your Bibles ready because we're going to be getting deep into the word. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, a great scripture on spiritual warfare says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness in this world, uh, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. Amen. Well, I heard this story of what happened in a church uh, one day. Uh, it was just a few minutes before the service began, and the townspeople were gathering into the church, and they were sitting, and they were talking. And suddenly, Satan himself, in the flesh, appeared at the front of the church. Everyone was startled. Everyone began to scream and to yell. They were running for the exits, some to the front, some to the side, some to the back exits. And they were almost trampling each other to get out of that church. Soon everyone had exited the church except for one elderly gentleman who sat calmly in one of the front pews without moving, seeming oblivious to the fact that God's ultimate enemy was right there in his presence. So Satan walked up to the old man and he said, don't you know who I am? The old man replied, yep, sure do. Aren't you afraid of me? Satan asked. Nope, sure ain't said the man. Don't you realize that I can kill you with a word, asked Satan. Don't doubt it for a minute, said the gentleman in a very even tone. Don't doubt it for a minute. Do you know that I can cause you to be in pain and suffering throughout eternity in a horrifying agony of physical pain? And the man said, yep, as he replied calmly. Aren't you afraid, said Satan. Nope. 
Now more than a little perturbed, Satan said, well, why aren't you afraid of me? The man calmly said, I've been married to your sister for 41 years. (laughs) Now, some of you, you know, may say that you have married the daughter of the devil or the son of Satan, but it really isn't true. The Bible says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You may have had all sorts of a uh, marital mess. Now, you know, marriage has been difficult from the very beginning of time. You know, Adam and Eve. I mean, it wasn't a very good start, was it? And, you know, I heard the story of, of Adam, where he had come back uh, three nights in a row uh, late, and his wife, Eve, was very upset the third night. She f- met him right at the doorway of the tent, and she confronted him. She says, do you have another woman in your life? He said, what are you talking about, woman? There's no other woman on earth. And uh, so anyway, that night he was sleeping soundly and all of a sudden he felt something at his side and he woke up, uh, something pressing at his side and he said to Eve, what are you doing? She said, I'm checking to see if there's any missing ribs. She was counting ribs. Turn to the person next to you and say, I ain't got it that bad. You ain't got it that bad. Well, in order to be effective in spiritual warfare, you need to know what you're up against. You need to understand that you are not up against flesh and blood. You need to understand something else, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Let's say this together. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It does not say that there will be no weapon formed against you. That's the problem that a lot of Christians have is they don't realize that there will be many weapons that will be formed against them. There will be many attacks. There will be many times that the enemy will try to destroy you. To steal, kill, and destroy is his job description. He wouldn't be doing his job if he wasn't trying those things and making those attempts. But the Bible's very clear. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. So let's understand that and let's believe God for his blessings instead. Talk about blessings. This Thursday, I get a phone call from the, uh, one of the train, trainers over at Chipotle's. Brand new Chipotle's in Avon on uh, Lear Nagel Road. Just off the highway, very close to the big hospital there that Cleveland Clinic has. We uh, have a few pictures we're going to show you and then a little bit of a video of the place. I want to encourage you to, to take advantage. There it is. That first night we came in and we got about 300 meals and we had Paul Grodell's ministry coming and helping us to be able to uh, give away these meals and we also have had um, uh, the city mission involved and uh, we have a, a young man that came yesterday from the Alpha House in Oberlin where they're helping drug addicts be able to get free and we're getting the, this food out. But uh, let's go ahead and play that video if you have the video, that would be great. Uh, There's our guy Danny, Avon, he's Ohio. the guy that called and me. They are being very, very generous giving food to the needy and uh, I don't know what happened to that video, it's shaky. All right, so they're training, they're training, I don't know, 20 or so different employees that are they're doing all this food, but they can't sell the food. They want it to go into good hands. Amen? And so who did they call? They called the Scent Church. I have a relationship with Chipotle's, uh, and we're just uh, blessed. He says, hey, can you come tonight? I mean, if you got a phone call, and they said they had 300 meals for you to distribute, what would you do? I'm not going to hang up. I'm going to start calling people. I'm going to start working with the network of uh, relationships we have, and we've got the food out. We've got the word out, and we're feeding people. Amen. Jesus fed 5,000. We haven't quite got there yet, but we're going to be pretty close to 1,000. Put your hands together for Chipotle and Ascent Church working together, and uh, stay afterwards and have some Chipotle for lunch here. It's going to be a great, great time. All right, so... Today we're going to look in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, and we're going to look at the life of Joseph. How many of you absolutely love Joseph in the Bible? He's one of your favorites. I have to say he's one of my favorites as well. A tremendous man of God, a tremendous example for us. And we're going to look at Genesis 37 and uh, verses 17 through 20. Then we're going to skip down to 23 and uh, 24. It says, they moved... uh, 
It says, they had moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Skipping now to verse 23 and 24, it says, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Satan may throw you into a pit of despair, but God will always be there. That's the first point today. Satan may throw you in a pit of despair, but God will will always be there. It's important to understand that Satan is on a leash. How many of you have dogs? Yeah, is that all? How many of you have dogs? Okay. How many of you have cats? All right, more people with dogs. Well, you know, probably you don't have your cat on a leash. That would kind of be weird. But anyway, uh, I have two dogs and I walk them, you know, every day and my son Gideon walks them every day as well. We, we, you know, we have those dogs on a leash. They can't go very far. When somebody else with their dogs comes by, you know, we've got control of our dogs, and we just understand they're on a leash. Satan is on a leash. If he was not on a leash, he would kill you. Satan doesn't want to hurt you. Satan wants to kill you. And if he could, he would. Tell the person next to you, if he could, he would. I promise you, if he was able to kill you today, you'd be dead. And so you got to understand that he comes to steal kill and to destroy. That is his trademark. That is his job description. And that's where he was going originally with this whole story. His brothers, Joseph's brothers, very jealous, very petty, didn't like to see somebody else accelerating above them and, you know, being promoted above them. They wanted to kill him. Something happened from that verse where they said, hey, we're going to kill him to, hey, we're going to just sell him. What happened was God showed up. He said, Satan, you're, you're on a leash here. We're, we're not going to allow you to do what you ultimately want to do to Joseph because I have some purpose in this pain. Come on, somebody. God's got some purpose in the pain that you're going through right now. God's got some purpose in the pain that you've already gone through, the past pains as well as the present pains as well as the future pains. God's got a purpose in the pain. So notice that the, it says the pit was empty. Before they threw uh, Joseph into the pit, they stripped him. You know, the devil wants to strip you of everything. You know, they were able to, to take the shirt off of his uh, back, but they were not able to strip him of his convictions. They could strip him of his clothes, but they could not strip him from his character. The devil may take your stuff for a season, but he cannot take your genes for any reason. Come on, somebody. I said the devil may take your stuff for a season, but he cannot steal your dreams for any reason. We need to understand that while he was down there, he didn't stop dreaming. While he was down there, he didn't stop thinking about what God had already showed to him in his dreams. He knew he was in a pit of despair, maybe even in a pit of depression, but he was not going to let that be his final destination. Come on, child of God, and give me a big shout here today. If you're just saying, hey, I might be in a pit, but I'm not staying here. I'm not living here. Joseph was in an empty pit. You know you're in a pit when nobody's there but God. You know you're in a pit when you have nothing left but God. You know you're in a pit when you have no way out but God. How many of you have been there before? When you said, I'm in a pit here, there ain't no way I'm getting out of this without God. Somebody say, but God. Two greatest words in the Bible, but God. You know, situations that seem despairing, situations that seem depressing, discouraging, distressing. God says, hey, but God, he is able to lift you up and to get you out of that pit of depression, of despair, that pit. When you feel like no one cares. I mean, think about it. This is his family. 
This wasn't like some nasty neighbor. This wasn't some, you know, grumbling, you know, uh, jerk that didn't care about him, that was a, a crazy stranger. This was his own family that had thrown him into a pit. So uh, when we fall into a pit, we need to understand that there might be no one that seems to care but God. Amen? He always cares. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 says this, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. You know, a number of years ago, we had an NFL quarterback walk into this church right here where you're sitting today. His name was Jeff Garcia. At the time, he was starting for the Cleveland Browns. It was August, just in the preseason, and he he had a Sunday uh, available. He came into this church for the very first time. He heard the message that I was preaching that morning. At the end of the service, just like we have every Sunday, we had an altar call. Jeff Garcia raised his hand, and he walked forward and gave his life to Jesus Christ. About four weeks later, come on, yeah, put your hands together. It's pretty exciting. Doesn't happen in every church that you get a starting NFL quarterback saved on your Sunday morning service. Uh, about four weeks later, his girlfriend, Carmela De Caesar who at the time was the reigning Playboy Playmate of the Year from Avon Lake, Ohio. Some of you live in Avon Lake. I live on the city next to Avon Lake. It's very, very close. She walked into the church. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. And Pastor Patty and I had the opportunity to disciple them for several months and to pour into their lives. And later they got married and they're still married. Come on, that's a miracle right there. But I remember Jeff saying to me, Dr. Paul, on Saturday night, I'm on lockup. I'm like, what's lockup? That sounds like prison. He goes, listen, it doesn't matter if we have a home game. It doesn't matter if we have a away game. The whole team is on lockup. We're in a hotel, and we can't do anything from this time to that time. They want to make sure that nobody's out getting in trouble, playing around, whatever. They, you know, we can't go anywhere. I want you to call me and pray for me and disciple me. You know, Saturday night is a perfect time. You know you're going to get me. So uh, we had all sorts of discussions, late night discussions at lockup time with the Cleveland Browns quarterback at that time, Jeff Garcia. And I just remember asking him one, uh, I asked him many questions, but I asked him one question that I'll never forget. I said, Jeff, what is it like in the NFL when you take a snap? What is going through your head? And he said to me, without hesitation, he said, Dr. Paul, all I'm thinking about is getting rid of the ball. He says, that's all I'm thinking about is getting rid of that football. And I said, Jeff, that's exactly what we need to do with our cares. When we have the cares of this life that come at us, we need to understand that the longer we hold on to those cares, the greater chance that we're going to get smeared. You don't want to get creamed, Jeff. You want to get rid of that ball so you're not injured, so you can come back and play another Sunday. You want to be able to get rid of that ball, get it to your running back, get it to to one of your receivers, somebody that's going to take that ball and run with it and make some yardage. And we need to understand that when we have those cares of this world, this world, worries, anxieties that come our way, we need to cast our cares upon the Lord because he cares about us. We don't want to get smeared. Tell the person next to you, you don't want to get smeared. Pray more, worry less. I'm telling you, it's just a simple formula in life. You pray less, you worry more. So if you're worrying right now, that's a great opportunity for you to be able to realign your life and say, hey, listen, I need to pray more, so I'm going to worry less. Amen and amen. So we understand that God wants us to get up and out of the pit of despair. It's a place of emptiness. It's a place of loneliness. Billy Graham said the greatest problem in America before he died was loneliness. I mean, just not something that is a little problem, but it's a big problem. It's not just single people that are dealing with loneliness. It's married people that are dealing with loneliness as well. Our social media doesn't necessarily help loneliness. How many of you know you can have 5,000 Facebook friends and be lonely by yourself at home? Come on, you know it's true. Facebook, how many of you know Facebook friends aren't real friends? <laughs> oh, you guys are smart. At least 15 of you are smart. How many of you know Facebook friends are not real friends? Some of them may be a very small percentage of them, but most of them are just Facebook friends. They're just curious what you're doing, and you're curious what they're doing, and let's just leave it there. And so uh, 
The pit of despair is a place of emptiness, it's a place of loneliness, and it can also be a wilderness. Joseph was all alone, and he needed to face the loneliness and the wilderness that he was in. You may be in a wilderness right now, you may be uh, in a wilderness soon, or you may have just come out of a wilderness, but I'm just telling you, you're gonna experience some wilderness in your life. And uh, the key to understanding your wilderness is to uh, understand that you determine the length of time that you spend in your own wilderness. The children of Israel were in a, low, uh, a, a very long-term wilderness for how many years? 40 years. 40 years they did a sin cycle. 40 years they did a circle cycle. The distance between Egypt and Canaan is 11 days. That's frustrating when you think about it. That journey of 40 years could have taken 11 days. I know we've all been frustrated about maybe a tough job that you know, we face. Maybe you've been frustrated about a project. Maybe you've been frustrated you know, about a company that you work for. I don't know, we all have frustrations. But just think about something that could have taken 11 days took 40 years. And so they did not learn their lessons. They kept grumbling, they kept complaining, they kept uh, I, you know, worshiping idols other than the Lord their God. They kept lusting rather than trusting. And they just, they kept you know, uh, throwing off authority. You, know, you had Korah and his rebellion. Everybody thought they could do whatever they wanted. They didn't listen to authority. And so for 40 years, they saw the same scenery. Who here is ready to see some new scenery? Come on, somebody. Some of you have been in this wilderness for a long time. I just know. I feel it in my spirit. You've been in a wilderness for a long, long time, and you've been in a wilderness with relationships. You've been in a wilderness with your job. You've been in a wilderness with your health, and you're just saying, hey, I want to learn whatever I'm supposed to learn so I can get out of my wilderness and get into my promised land. Now, there was somebody else that went into a wilderness too. His name was Jesus. Come on, somebody. How long was Jesus in that wilderness? What? 40 40 what? Years? Uh, 40 days. Thank you, Carolyn. She's in charge of the widow's ministry. They're going to do a a lunch here soon, and we just bless them. Give a big hand to all the widows here at this church. They're great ladies. And, And we know that Jesus was in there for 40 days rather than 40 years. Now, why do you think that he was only in his wilderness for 40 days? You think maybe he was getting ready for his ministry? Do you think maybe he was doing things right instead of wrong? Do you think he was maybe submitted to God's will and God's word? It's very interesting that he was tempted in all ways. We only know about three of them, but there was a lot more than three. You do know that, right? I mean, you guys know that those are just the three highlighted ones. But he was tempted in all ways, just like you and I are tempted. But the Bible says that every time that he was tempted by Satan, he always said the same thing. What did he say? It is written, it is written, it is written. He said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. It is written that you shall only worship the Lord your God and him alone. It is written, do not test the Lord your God. So Jesus, uh, he learned what he needed to learn in that wilderness in 40 days, not 40 years. Hebrews chapter five, verse eight, is a great scripture about Jesus, and it says, Although he was a son, the son of God, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. You know what? I don't want to suffer for no reason. I know I'm going to suffer, but I just want to make sure that I learn what I'm supposed to learn through the suffering, through the pain. God, what is it that you're trying to show me? God, what can I do to comfort somebody else going through the same thing? God, what can I do to be able to be your representative through this wilderness experience? What do I need to learn from the word so that I can say it is written and I can live my life based on the word of God? Deal with your issues in the wilderness. Deal with it. Tell the person next to you, just deal with it. Tell the person on the other side, just deal with it. That was the problem. The children of Israel just didn't deal with it. They just kept repeating it. They just kept going in the same sin cycle. They just uh, continued 
doing what they were doing all along. If you want to have new results, you've got to do something different. Amen? You know the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Insanity. So I was in a real wilderness a number of years ago. I don't know if it was five or six years ago, but it was just a very, very difficult time in my life. And uh, I was coming to a place where I was in this pit, this pit of despair, you know, this pit of heaviness, you know, maybe depression in some way. But, you know, I was in a very difficult place. It was very hard. And uh, I cried out to the Lord, and I said, God, if you truly uh, want me uh, to continue doing what I'm doing, uh, ministering the way I'm ministering, I need you to show me a sign. Come on, does anybody ever ask God for a sign? God, I want you to show me a sign. I need a word. God, I'm in a pit here. I need to get out of this pit. I don't want to live in this pit. There's got to be something else. There's a greater purpose, a greater plan. I don't want to live in this hole. Amen? So, very interesting. Uh, I pray this. That very Sunday, a woman comes to the church I'm going to name her name because I want you to know that I didn't make this up. And you can go talk to Jan Martin. Jan is uh, uh, J-A-N. Jan Martin uh, came to the uh, Sunday, that Sunday, and she uh, had actually, her husband had died, left the church about five years previous to that. So she hadn't been around for a good five years. I recognized her. I wasn't even sure exactly what, what her full name was, but I recognized her immediately. She said, Dr. Paul, I need to tell you something. She said, God woke me up last night in the middle of the night, and he told me that I'm supposed to come to this church this morning and to encourage you and to tell you that he is still with you. True story. That Sunday, we had one of the largest offerings that we've seen in the entire year. Just so happened to be another sign. And it was just one of those moments in my life where I said, I'm out of this wilderness. I'm out of here. I am climbing out of this pit, and I'm not living here because I know that's not God's will. Amen? Today, some people are starting to look at that pit, and they're starting to look up and say, God, I'm done living in this pit. God, I'm done living down here in despair. God, I want you Uh, to understand I'm casting my cares upon you and you intervene on my behalf. I'm here to let you, uh, no, you don't let go of your faith when you're in that pit. You don't let go of your faith when you're in that place where you feel like you can barely survive. You're playing like in survivors, spiritual survivors, you know the the show, survivors, and you just feel like, hey, God, I've I've got to hold on here because if I let go, I'm not going to make it. I don't want to live in this pitch black place. I don't want to do that. It's very interesting, rats. Everybody say rats. They did an experiment with rats and to understand how important light is. And so what they did is they put uh, rats in an aquarium, you know, a little water aquarium, and they uh, let a light on. They left the light on, and they, they swam for th- up to 36 hours. They could swim for 36 hours before they finally drowned, and that was it. When they turned off the lights, and it was pitch black, how long do you think the rats swam for before they drowned and died? Three minutes. Three minutes versus 36 hours, over 700 times more time when you have a little light. Come on, somebody, help me here today. This church is getting way too quiet. Am I, am I in a Presbyterian church today? Uh, am I in a Methodist church today? Come on, am I in a Holy Ghost church today? Come on, let's act like we're Holy Ghost people. Man, quiet church. We have to understand that when we have some light, when God starts to speak to us in his word, when we, when we start to break open the word of God and we start to remember all the good things that God's done for us in the past, then all of a sudden we have the ability to swim and not to drown. We have the ability to be able to not just survive but to thrive. Tell the person next to you, you're more than a survivor, you're a thriver. You're much more than a, just a survivor. Number two is Satan may try 
to throw you into a pleasure palace of temptation. But God will always be there to help you find a way of escape. Everybody just go ahead and shout it out. Come on, right here. Pleasure palace. Everybody say pleasure palace. All right, here we go. In the book of Genesis chapter 39, verses 6 through 12, it says, So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now, Joseph was well built. That means he was strong. He was buff. And he was handsome, good looking. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. How many of you know she wasn't wanted, wanted to just read him some, you know, fairy tale or something story? It wasn't a bedtime story, all right? She wanted to seduce the man. All right, but he refused. With me in charge, he said to her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has held nothing from me except you because you're his wife, obvious. How then do I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now, five times in uh, chapter 39, the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. How many of you understand God is with you? And if God is with you, who can be against you? You need to understand when we're overcoming Satan, when we have to make this declaration, not today, Satan, that we are saying, hey, it's not because me, it's because of who lives in me. The greater is he that lives in me than he that is in the world. And you need to be convinced of that and you need to know that and you need to speak that and you need to pray that and you need to act on that. Just because Joseph had uncommon favor in his life didn't mean that he wasn't going to have common temptation in his life. I'm going to say it again. I'm preaching better than you're shouting today. Just because he had uncommon favor in his life didn't mean that he didn't have common temptation. You're never going to get too spiritual not to be tempted. No matter how long you've been a Christian, no matter how much of the words you know, you are still going to be tempted for the rest of your life. So just get ready and get used to it. Amen? It's coming your way, baby. And so here he is, Joseph, the man of God. He's a man of integrity. He isn't just being tempted once or twice or thrice. I have a feeling she was trying different outfits on. She's like, do you like this bikini? What do you think about red? How do I like this little red short skirt? I think she was saying, you know, what do you think about this bra? I have a feeling she was walking in and he was walking out. She was setting him up with anything that she possibly could. She was baiting the trap. Somebody say baiting the trap. She was baiting the trap. And so, uh, you know, everybody's going to be tempted. Even Frank Andre will be tempted. Sitting in my second row right here, 92 years of age. I remember, it was, I'll give it to you. I was about 25 years ago. We were driving down the street together. It was just father and son. He was driving, and I was riding shotgun with pops. And uh, there was a girl on the sidewalk, a young lady, okay, and uh, she had some short shorts on. She was riding her bike, and, I mean, it was all on display. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. And I, I looked at it, and I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad... Do you still look at girls? And he responded and said, son, I love your mother. He didn't answer the question. He just said, son, I love your mother. Frank Andre, the most holy man on earth. I mean, Billy Graham used to be, now it's Frank Andre. Do you get what I'm saying? You're gonna be tempted. Men, women, we're all going to be tempted. What's important is that we don't fall into temptation. Amen? Amen. If Jesus was tempted, how are you going to say you're not going to be tempted? If Jesus wasn't tempted in all ways, you know, then we could say that, but we know that he was, so let's not lie. Let's not deceive ourselves. Joseph had gone through a lot already, but now he was facing Hotifer, not Potiphar. Hotifer, Potiphar's wife. Some of you are going to get that after the service. Potiphar was cool with Joseph. 
Potiphar loved Joseph. He was like, what more can I give you? I want to give you money. I want to give you keys. You know, I want to, I want to give you authority. Everything you touch, you're like Midas. You have the Midas touch. It's all turned into gold. He says, listen, you can drive my Mercedes chariot. It's got air conditioning every single day. Whenever you want to go someplace, just take the chariot. Take the Mercedes. You know, you're cool with it. I trust you. And then Potiphar comes along. And she's not cool for Joseph. She's hot for Joseph. There's a big difference. She's hot for Joseph, and she is pursuing him. I mean, I can imagine she was hot as well. I have a feeling that she is probably on the front cover of the Egyptian Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. You know, the swimsuit edition just came out. You know that. All right. So she was on the front cover. And uh, maybe, you know, she was the centerpiece. I don't know. But I'm just letting you know that just because you have uncommon favor in your life doesn't mean you're not going to have common temptation in your life. And you got to be ready to face it. And this is exactly what he did. He did face it. God wanted to see if he could trust Joseph in every area. Somebody say every area. God wanted to see if Joseph would uh, be able to choose trust over lust, obedience over expedience. Joseph knew that if he gave in to her, he would be forsaking his God-given dream. And uh, with that temptation would come destruction and loss. Joseph did the best thing anyone could ever do. What did he do with temptation? He ran. He didn't come and talk to it. He didn't say, well, let's, let's try to, you know, just be friends uh, on Facebook and, you know, just DM me. You know, I don't want to make this look weird in public. Yeah, I mean, he just booked. He was gone. He was out of there. And that was the way that he got busted. Because when he left, she grabbed a hold of his jacket and made up a story. Come on, somebody say story. The Bible says, flee youthful lust in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call upon the Lord with a pure heart. One of the greatest ways that you can stay pure is being around pure people. You get around people that are telling dirty jokes and they're, you know, hanging out and they're, you know, chasing skirts and all that kind of stuff. You're going to be influenced by the people that you're around. So if you want to stay pure, you want to stay clean, you want to stay sober, you got to be around sober people. Amen. And so uh, the Bible says this to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, there's no temptation overtaking you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be suffering more than you uh, can handle. Uh, with the temptation, you also will make a way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. So one thing is for sure is that God is not gonna allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. That's something that we need to understand and that Every single time that Satan throws temptation at us, we need to look for the exit ramp. Amen? Where's the exit ramp? For, uh, John, uh, for Joseph, it was literally leaving the house, running out. You know, he had to take that exit ramp. Jesus, every single time, he always quoted the word. Understand the word. Speak the word. When you're dealing with Hotifer in your life, start speaking the word. You know, hey, I've got a good... Uh, husband waiting for me. I've got a good man uh, waiting for me. I've got a godly girl waiting for me. I'm, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to give in to what my convictions are uh, for any way, shape, or form. It, just a, uh, a side note, it's very interesting. You know, we, we need to use the name of Jesus. The power of the word of God and the name of Jesus are amazing. If you want to overcome Satan, you've got to speak the name of Jesus. Just say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Acts chapter 19, there's seven sons of Sceva, and they're trying to cast out demons. And they, they say, you know, come out, you know, in the name of uh, Paul or whatever. And, and the demon responds, and they say, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, we don't know you. Why did they not know him? Because they did not know the word of God and they did not know how to use the name of Jesus. You know what? When you know the word of God, the devil will know you. When you use the name of Jesus rightly, the devil will know you. Amen? It's important for us to understand 
just how powerful the name of Jesus is and always be optimistic about every single situation that we may face, even if it's temptation. God's with you. Amen? God was with him five times in that chapter. Didn't mean he wasn't going to be tempted. So I'm going to tell you a story about what Harvard University did a number of years ago. They wanted to do a study with, an eight, with two eight-year-old boys. One was an optimist and one was a pessimist. So they took the, the pessimist boy uh, and they put him in a room filled with toys. I mean, really nice toys, top-end toys, not cheap little things, nice toys. They left him in there for an hour and they came and an hour later and the kid was grumpy. The kid was upset. They said, what's going on? Why, why are you upset? He said, oh, there's nothing to do in here. And he had taken these toys, and a lot of them, he had broken the toys, and, you know, he just wasn't happy. And so they, they went ahead, and they put the optimistic kid, they put him in a room filled with manure. I mean, it was piled high. And they left him in there for an hour, Say, well, let's see what this kid does with a pile of crap. And so an hour later, they come back, and the kid is down in the middle of the pile of manure. And there's manure on the ceiling, there's manure on the walls, there's manure everywhere. And they said to him, they said, son, what are you doing? He said, listen, with all this horse crap down here, there's got to be a pony down there somewhere. You know, you, you get manure thrown at you, it's very important to understand that's great fertilizer. Amen. There's going to be something down there for you. There's going to be something down there that you can look for, and God's going to bless you, and God's going to take care of you. And that is a joke, by the way. All right, so don't be looking for that story online. I got good news for you. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, 19, it says, but my God shall supply all your needs. That's an S. That's a plural. It doesn't say he'll just supply some of your needs. That means he's going to supply your financial needs, your needs to be able to overcome temptation in your life, your needs to be able to take care of your family, to be able to walk in health and in all the good things that God wants for you. So we need to understand when Satan comes to try to offer you a shortcut to God's plan, you got to simply say, not today, Satan. That's what temptation is. Temptation is basically an illegitimate we, uh, means to get a legitimate need met in your life. So we don't take the bait of Satan. We go the route that God has given to us, which we know in his word. So how many of you are married? Raise your hand if you're married. Okay, good. Quite a few of you, about half of you are married here. So how many of you like to divorce-proof your marriage? Amen, right? Okay, now, this is very interesting. Right now, uh, the largest increase of divorces in America are between the ages of 55 and 64, okay? It's the empty nesters that all of a sudden are waking up and realizing the kids are gone and there's real, no real relationship between them. And 70% of the time in these divorces, the wife is initiating the divorce. There are now more people in America living together than are married, okay? So this has just happened recently. It's most, you know, in, in our uh, nation's history. And we, you know, come to the place where there's more single people than there are married people. So, you know, what's the deal? People have said a lie for years and years. They say that if you're in the church, your chance of divorce is 50%. And if you're in the world, the chance of divorce is 50%. How many of you have heard that before? I've heard it a lot of times. I'm surprised you haven't. So here's the real truth. The real truth is, if you want to lower your divorce possibilities, the divorce rate, you got to understand that, yeah, in the world, it is about 50% divorce. However, if you attend church on a weekly basis, your divorce chance goes to 12%. From 50% down to 12% by doing one thing for an hour and a half, coming to church, listening to a preacher preach, praying with your family, letting them get some ministry in the kids' ministry, and just simply saying, hey, I'm going to let God have the first day of the week, the first hour and whatever, and half of the week. You just went from 50% to 12%. How many of you would like to go to 1% or less divorce chance? Here it is. CBN did this study, you know, 700 Club, a number of years ago. They studied people that prayed together and read the word of God together, couples that did that every single day. 
and they found that the chances of divorce with couples that prayed together and they read the word of God together every single day was one out of 500. That, to me, is divorce proof. One-fifth of 1% one of couples that will just take that, uh, you know, practice, that principle, and put it into practice, how powerful is that? So Joseph lost his coat, but he did not lose his character. He lost his shirt, but he didn't lose his pants. He, he lost, uh, uh, you know, his, his freedom, but he did not lose his dream. They sent him to prison. This is the last one, and we'll close with this. Satan may throw you in prison, but God will always provide a release for you. Some of you may be in a prison. I'm just telling you, it's time for a jailbreak. In the book of Genesis chapter 39 and verse 19, it says, when his master heard the story that his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Somebody say story. It says, when his master heard the story. How many of you know there's plenty of stories out there that aren't true? You know, there's not just fake news on, you know, media, but there's fake news in your office. There's fake news in the church. Not every news story is true. You got to understand that, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't true that people say or people do. And so this story, unfortunately, still landed Joseph in prison. God was still with him. The plan of God did not get stopped because he was in prison. In fact, it continued, and God was continuing to work in him because he was giving him training for reigning. Today, the things that you're going through is training for reigning. And I'm talking about R-E-I-G-N-I-N-G, reigning with Christ forever and ever. You're getting training for reigning. Tell the person next to you, I'm getting training for reigning. Pardon my dust, I'm under construction. You know, we're under construction right now. You know, Joseph was under construction, and here he is, training for reigning. And, and uh, it's important uh, that you understand that God wants to help you, and he's still going to give you those gifts that he's always given to you, even when you're in that prison, uh, that, that prison place. And what ended up happening was that Joseph was there, and there was a cupbearer, and there was a baker that came to him, and they said, we've had disturbing dreams. He could tell they were depressed. He said, what's wrong? He said, we had these dreams, and one guy shares his dream, and the other guy shares his dream, and, and Joseph rightly discerns exactly the meaning of those dreams. The, the cupbearer is taken back and restored in his position, goes back to the king, and, and, to Pharaoh, and Joseph says, hey, remember me when you get back to your restored position. And then the other guy, the baker, was taken out and hung. They, they killed him, just like Joseph had said. His gift was still there even though he was in prison. God wants you to know that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. You may have gone through a hot mess. You may have gone through all sorts of difficulty, all sorts of pain, all sorts of suffering. Maybe you went through a divorce. Maybe you've lost some people that were really close to you, death in your life. But I'm just telling you, God's still with you. God still is going to use you. God still wants to take your life and make your life count for him. He could have given up in that prison, but he did not. He looked up. God wants us to understand but Joseph was not crying over his circumstances in, in prison. He was helping other prisoners. One of the best things you can do when you're in pain is serve somebody else. Minute to serve to somebody else. Take that Chipotle meal and give it to somebody that's hurting. Give it to an old widow. Give it to a, a person that's elderly. Give it to a child. Give, get, take your blessing and pass it on to somebody else. Somebody say amen. Today you might be in a prison. Your prison may be different from Joseph's. It may be a prison of pornography. You may be in a prison of anger. You may be in a, a prison uh, of fear in your life. But God wants you to understand that he wants to break you out of that prison just like he did. Maybe it's a prison of offense where you've been hurt and you've been, off, uh, you've been offended. My friend John Bevere wrote a book called The Bait of Satan, and I'm just telling you, a lot of Christians have, been, have fallen for this bait of Satan, and God wants to get you out. Paul and Silas were in a prison one night, and they began to call out to God, and they cried out to God, and they began to sing praises to God, and the Holy Spirit came, and I'm just telling you, literally opened up the prison. 
And they not only saw those men released, but also the prisoners with them. I had a, a businessman, a very successful businessman in our church, call me on a Friday night and said, I, I need to meet with you and my wife tomorrow morning in your office at 8 a.m. I'm like, this is not good. How many of you know when somebody on a Saturday morning says, I need to meet with you at 8 a.m., it's not good? So I said, okay, I'll meet you. I'll come in early to meet with you. And the gentleman, I mean, he just, he, he cut to the chase. He said, listen, Dr. Paul, he says, I've been excessively drinking, I've been taking prescription medications. I'm on a, a, a death trail right now. I'm on a high, highway to death. And I need help. I need intervention. And I didn't even know this. I mean, I knew he drank a little bit, but I didn't know it was, you know, where he was at, binge drinking. It was very, very serious. And he says, I want to submit myself to you. I want to have you help me. I'm going to go into a rehab center. I want to, you know, I want to start all off. I want to start off right, and I want to have some accountability in my life. And, and we did that. And the wonderful thing is about seven years later, he's still sober. Come on, put your hands together. Sometimes you just need somebody that's going to love you, pray for you, hold you accountable, help you to be able to get up out of your prison, out of your pit, whatever it is, and to be able to say, hey, I'm with you. God is with you, but I'm also with you. Tell the person next to you, hey, I'm with you. I don't know if you know this, but there are over 100 names for God in the Bible. Over 100 names for God. Seven of those names, seven of them deal with redeem redemption. Okay, Redeemer, because he is a Redeemer. Our God wants to redeem us from whatever situation that we may be facing. Joseph understood that he had gone through a lot of bad stuff, but it was all in training for reigning because God had some good stuff for him. And what ended up happening was he was promoted from the prison to the palace in one day. Somebody say one day. One day God can change your destiny. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes today? It's all about being willing to trust God in your pit, in your prison, through your temptation. I don't know where you're at today, but I have a feeling that almost every one of you has got one of those three or maybe two of those three or maybe all three of those situations that you are facing right now. And today, if you would say, God, I know you were able to lift up Joseph in the word and I know that he didn't let go of his faith, and I'm not going to let go of my faith. I'm going to trust you through it all. If that's you today, raise your hand at the count of three, and I want to pray for you because today is the day that we say, not today, Satan. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this congregation today. Say, not today, Satan. Amen, amen, amen. Father, today, I pray for your people. I pray, Lord, that... Each and every one will be encouraged today that they can make it. They don't have to fake it. Lord, that you are as real as the mention of your name and as close as the mention of your name. And today we just say that name, Jesus. Just say it, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We are not going to, to bow down to the bully of bullies, Satan himself. We're not going to allow him to... Uh, beat us or overcome us because we've been called to be overcomers of evil. And God, we're going to overcome evil with good. Today, Lord, I pray for strength. I pray for supernatural empowerment. God, today I pray for wisdom from above. Today I pray for encouraging signs and wonders like you gave me a few years ago when Chan Martin walked in this church and said, Dr. Paul, I've been woken up in the middle of the night. God told me to come down here and tell you something. God's got some specific words for some specific people today. And God, today, is their day a breakthrough in Jesus' name. Now, with every eye closed and every head bowed, it's an opportunity for you to be able to receive the same Jesus that an NFL quarterback received here just a few years ago. And, and a girl that was a playboy, playmate of the year. It doesn't matter if you have uh, a million followers on Instagram or if you have, you know, a status as being a celebrity, whether it's a sports celebrity or a business person, doesn't matter. People might know your name, they might not know your name, but God knows your name. 
And today he wants to do something with your name. He wants to put your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And today if you say, I want to dedicate my life to the Lord, I want to rededicate my life to the Lord, some of you, this is just saying, hey, I'm going to get back with my relationship with God. If that's you, at the count of three, you want to find forgiveness today, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Yes, raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. God bless you. I want to lead you out in a prayer of confession of your need for Jesus Christ and all those that are with us here today. Let's pray out with them that have already received the Lord. Say, Father in heaven, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against others. I've sinned against myself. And I know you died for me. So now I want to live for you. Take me this day. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness. Make me whole. Make me holy. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me strong. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give them a big hand to them. Let's all stand to our feet. Today, I just want you to confess one more time, the count of three. One, two, three. Not today, Satan. I pray that you all get this t-shirt. I pray that you, you know, you don't just got the t-shirt, but you know, you can talk about it day to day, you know, and you will live that life. Not today, Satan. When trouble comes your way, you begin to declare, not today, Satan. Right now, some of our men and women are going, they're getting uh, tables set up. They're gonna move some tables. We want you to stay. We're gonna have food within about 10 minutes. It's gonna be really, really quick. And uh, we know a few of you have to leave, but I hope that most of you are able to stay and have some Chipotle and, and have some fellowship together. It's all free and we just love you and bless you. And then of course, tonight at seven o'clock, if you wanna help with the wrapping up of the work day, you weren't able to be here yesterday, you can meet us for about an hour and a half with Pastor Jordan. God bless you. Have a Jesus-filled day.